اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على سیدنا و مولانا اب القاسم المصطفی محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين روحي وارواح العالمين له الفداء رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقتة من لساني يفقه قولي So dear brothers and sisters, I say welcome to each and every one of you and by the grace of Allah, I also would like to thank Allah first for the building that he's allowed us to be in and then to each and every one of you. This is a building that was built, alhamdulillah, the youth of the community came together, they made a great effort, and Allah assisted them. It wasn't only the youth of this community, there were other communities, both here and brothers and sisters abroad, who helped to build this. And inshallah, we hope that this is a building which is based on taqwa, and from the beginning to the end, the steps that we take are steps that help to, inshallah, hasten the reappearance of our Imam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So brothers and sisters, this Muharram, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to be covering the story of Nabi Lut. We're going to, inshallah, be some, learning some valuable lessons from his life and his uprising and what he did for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, before we begin, and brothers and sisters are used to this, the idea that we've always, not always, but alhamdulillah, Allah has given us the tawfiq to discuss several of the prophets of God, the Anbiya, and to draw parallels between what they did and our current mission. So one question that immediately comes to mind is, what is the connection between the Qiyam of Nabi Lut and the Qiyam of Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam? Now, there are, when we think about this question, what's the connection between those two events? More than that, there's another connection we want to make. What's the connection between that story, those two incredible, extraordinary events in history, and the Imam of the time? What's the connection between those, those stories, our current responsibility, and what we need to do for the Imam of the time? And there are going to be some powerful lessons, inshallah, that we can draw. And some observations that we can make. Hopefully that will help us move forward and prepare the grounds for the return of our Imam. Because as was rightly mentioned before I came on board, we're not only looking to Karbala, and this madrasa of Imam Hussein to better ourselves individually, to increase our own spirituality. That's one important component, but we also want to grow as an ummah. Right now, brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters in Kashmir, they're still on lockdown. They still have no means of communicating with the outside world. Their children still can't go to school. Or if we look in other places in the Muslim world, in Yemen, what's happening? In Palestine, what's happening? In Syria, what's happening? So all around the world, brothers and sisters, we see that Karbala and those who are the enemies of Imam Hussein are very much alive. So the Qiyam of Imam Hussein is real. Now we also want to delve into this story and see the connections between this story, the uprising of Nabi Lut and how brave he was in our current situation and how we can use this to, inshallah, hasten the reappearance of the Imam. Now, the answer to this question might seem obvious, the connection between the two, especially when you and I look at the words of Imam Hussein. You see, he introduces his reason for Qiyam better than anyone else. Let's review the words of Imam Hussein. This is what he says. Inni lam akhruj ashiran wa la batira. That I did not do this qiyam. I didn't rise up out of arrogance. He says, wa la mufsidan wa la zalima. I didn't go to cause corruption, nor to do oppression to anyone. He says, wa inna ma kharajtu 
أطب الإصلاح في أمة جدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. He says that I, the reason for me rising up was that I wanted to do Amr bil Ma'roof. I wanted to do Islah. He says, أريد أن أمر بال Ma'roof وأنها عن المنكر. I wanted to invite to what's good and forbid what is evil. So I wanted to correct this ummah. I care about them, their responsibilities, what happens to them. And I'm also concerned. I want to do what's right. I want to do Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahin Munkar. So you and I are going to see a lot of that in the story of Nabi Lut. The idea of trying to correct people, trying to straighten what's wrong, trying to stand for what's right. What we'll see in this story, brothers and sisters, are going to be parallels between these two. The highest levels of spiritual purity, something else that we need to discuss in detail, ideological bravery, ideological bravery. We'll also see commitment to the cause, willingness to sacrifice, care for fellow, our fellow human beings. We're going to see great resistance under incredible circumstances, and also, in the story of Nabi Lut, delivery. That Allah came to his assistance and he delivered him. Of course, the end for Imam Hussein was different. There wasn't that supernatural delivery. The end was Karbala. Now, Nabi Lut, and you'll, when, inshallah, when we get into the details of this story, you'll see that he was prepared to sacrifice. He was prepared that the story not end with delivery. He was prepared to pay the ultimate price. Allah delivers. We'll see this inshallah in the ayat of the Quran. At the last second, Allah delivered him. But he was mentally and physically prepared, spiritually prepared for whatever the outcome was, Allah chose to deliver him. Allah chose to deliver him. And brothers and sisters, you and I, as we prepare for the imam of the time, we have to be ready for all possibilities and inshallah able to do our responsibilities. Having said that, brothers and sisters, of course, there is no comparison between the struggle of Imam Hussein and that of Nabi Lut. As was rightly taught to us by Imam al Hassan, he says this He says, La yawm ka yawmaka, ya Aba Abdullah. There was never a day in humanity, in the history of humanity, which was like the day of Imam Hussein. So that sacrifice was special. But I like the idea of there being parallels, and then after that, inshallah, some lessons. Now, one other thing for us to keep in mind, and this is something that is again a little bit closer to home and a point that directly relates to the coming of the Imam of the time. When God talks about the people of Lut, this is what God says about them. So this is Surah 26, verse number 160. God says this, كَذَّبَتْ قَوْمُ لُوتٍ الْمُرْسَلِينَ that the Qawm of Lut, the people of Lut, rejected all of the prophets. Now you and I might say, but they only rejected one, Nabi Lut, he came. The Quran says no, they rejected every prophet that was ever sent on mankind. The Mursaleen, they were rejected by these people. Why is that? Why is that? Actually, what happens is every prophet is coming to deliver one message. All of the Anbiya of Allah and the Imams, the Aimma, they're all here to preach and teach Islam. They want to see that we human beings experience God's best. They want to see us discover all of our talents and go to far, as far as we can as human beings. That's the mission of the Anbiya. And because they're all preaching Tawheed and they're all preaching Islam, and their mission is the same, rejecting one prophet is like rejecting all prophets. Having said that, the prophets, when their mission is all the same, their mission is that of Imam Mahdi. They all tried, like Imam Mahdi will to, to build and establish that kingdom of God on the earth. They all wanted to see that happen. They had varying levels of success. Some of them, prophets we've covered before. Nabi Dawood, Nabi Sulaiman, Allah gave them that success and they established the kingdom of God right here on the earth. Other prophets, like Nabi Lut, had that same mission. They resisted, they preached, they taught, 
but Allah chose not to grant them the kingdom on the earth. In the case of Nabi Lut, of course, he was delivered. So some of the prophets just resisted, but they weren't able to get that kingdom. Now, for you and I, having established these different points, the connections between Nabi Lut, what he was doing, our responsibilities, it's all one message, all one sharia. Some of the details were different, but the core message was always the same. If you and I can take these lessons from the story of Nabi Lut, and prepare for the Imam of the time. Be like Nabi Lut to resist under incredible pressure, not to give in, to stand strong. We have beautiful hadith where the Imam, this is the fourth Imam, he talks about you and I. What does he say? The Imam says this, Innal muntadhirin. Inshallah we can be these people. Truly those people who are muntadhir, they haven't changed. Like Nabi Lut, still resisting. Those people who believe and have accepted the Imam of the Imam of the time, he says, Afdalu min kulli zamanin. Afdalu min ahli kulli zamanin. They're better than the people of all times. Those people who, stead, who stay steadfast. He says, Why are they better? Why is it that these people are special? Nabi Lut under those circumstances, Nabi Ibrahim, all of those other Anbiya, why are we special? The Imam says this. He says, Allah has granted these people such intellect, such an understanding of the faith, that the absence of the Imam for them is the exact same thing as if the Imam was present. We know, you and I, that the Imam is watching this gathering and the other gatherings that are there around the world. And he's seeing those people who come out of these gatherings as Husseini, getting inspiration from these gatherings and who are going to turn them into practical steps that they can take in their lives. Now, before I begin the story itself, a little bit about the importance of this story. The importance of this story. Now, brothers and sisters, you and I know that every verse that Allah chooses for the Quran is of strategic importance. We've already learned, you and I, that all of the details of the Sharia are not found in the Quran. Many times Allah goes over and He establishes a principle, but the details are left to the Ahadith, the Sunnah. So even if it's something as important as Hajj, how important is Hajj? Salah, Zakah, right? very, very important. The details though, we find them in the Ahadith. How many times, brothers and sisters, do you think the story of Nabi Lut is mentioned in the Quran? How many verses do we have in the Quran about the story of Nabi Lut? 82 verses about Nabi Lut. 27 times his name is mentioned. 14 different surahs. It all didn't come in one surah. Allah told the surah. No, many surahs. In at least six places in the Quran, Allah tells his story in detail. So this is one of those stories that God wanted all of mankind to know. Everybody's supposed to know the story of Nabi Lut. And as you know, brothers and sisters, it's also mentioned in the Old Testament and the New Testament. They've also heard this story. That's also very important. I'm going to mention some details about that later, but just the idea that although we're going to differ on the details, there'll be correction the Quran will make, but the idea that Allah wanted everybody to know, this to be repeated, people to know what happened. So what happens is sometimes if people aren't careful, they can get scared or intimidated by the propaganda that's out there. I remember I was in Canada after the shooting happened. Remember they shot the guy, Omar, Lan, Omar Mateen, he went and shot up a gay bar. When he went and shot that up, right, we were having majalis, having some lectures at that time, so Ramadan. So I remember after the majlis, after the lecture, a sister came to me. And the sister told me this, she said, I don't even know, she was so worried. 
you guys remember the propaganda, what it was like at the time after Omar uh, Mateen went and shot up those, those people. She was so worried, she said, I don't even know if we should tell our kids the story of Nabi Lut. Maybe they'll repeat it somewhere, maybe well, that'll get us into trouble. The opposite of what we're supposed to do. The Quran, how many times did it repeat the story? How important was it for us as believers to know the story and share the story, especially the mothers who are talking to their children, who are delivering that first level of iman that you get in the house that's different from the intellectual iman that you get later. How important is it to tell this story? So this is not one of those stories where we're gonna back down or we get scared or intimidated as a middle mu'mineen tells us this. He says, la ta'tadir. Never apologize. Min amran ata'atallah fi. Never apologize for obeying God. He says, fakafa bidhalika man qaba. Actually, that is an honor for you. That's enough for an honor. You're doing what God said? It's true, everybody else isn't saying that. Let them. The believer, those who are waiting for the Imam of the time, they stand strong on these principles. They don't back down, they don't get intimidated, they don't get scared. It's like that story I heard that's not true, inshallah. They said once there was a mother and she was going over and she was training her children. She was delivering or making breakfast or making pancakes. And what happened was the two little boys, they started to fight over the pancakes. Kevin and Ryan, they started fighting over the pancakes. And the mother said, you know what? Now is a great time to teach them a moral story. She turned to her boys, she said, boys, what would Jesus do if he was here? You know what Jesus would do? He would say, give my brother the pancake. So the little boys listened, and Kevin turned to Ryan. He said, Ryan, you be Jesus. <laughs> it's not always the case that it's good for me as a believer to back down. Never, as the middle moment he said, never apologize. You're doing the right thing. You're explaining the ayat of the Qur'an. The Qur'anic instructions, these are now strategic. The Qur'anic instructions, Surah 25, so Surah Furqan, what does God tell us to do? This is now for us as we pave the way for the Mahdi. He says this, فَلَا تُتِعِ الْكَافِرِينَ So do not, God says, do not obey the kuffar. Do not obey the kuffar. He says, وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جَهَادًا كَبِيرًا He says, actually, by not obeying, when it comes to your beliefs, when it comes to your rulings, by not obeying, he says, do a great jihad by not obeying. So our responsibility is to understand these stories and to share these stories. Now, I mentioned that this story is also told in the Bible. And by the way, if I could get a cup of water, from one of the brothers, I would definitely make du'a for him to be, inshallah, in paradise. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I mentioned that this story is mentioned in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But unfortunately, in the biblical version of this story, there is terrible character assassination. The, f the hero and heroines, because it's going to be Nabi Lut. Jazakumullah khairan. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Inshallah, you go to paradise. Now, and again, brothers, let's, let's also clarify this. It's not that you and I, as believers, when I say the Bible said this and the Bible got it wrong. It's not that you and I, as believers, don't respect that book, the Injil that was revealed to Isa, or the Torah that was revealed to Musa. You have the utmost, people can't even imagine how much respect we have for those books. What I'm talking about is the current Bible. We all know that that Bible was written after Isa. After Isa. And there are things in the Bible that definitely no way they are revelation, including how they defamed the story or the heroes in this story. The stuff they say 
about the heroes and champions of this story. The people who were champions when it came to ideological bravery and purity. The stuff they say about them is stuff that you and I would not even say about an average Christian or Jew. We would never say these things about them, let alone a prophet and his daughters. You'll see that, and I want to get to Nabi Lut, but first let's just talk a little bit about his daughters and their, their struggle. They're the heroines in this story. I want to share one of the verses of the Quran that talks about them. Surah 51 and verses number 35 and 36. God's describing them in this way. He says, فَأَخْرَجْنَا مَنْ كَانَ فِيهَا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ When God was about to deliver his chastisement, and destroy those wicked people. He says, we delivered, we removed from there man kana fiha min al mu'minin. The believers that were left there, we delivered them, we brought them out. Fama wajadna fiha ghayra baytim min al muslimin. But when we looked, we didn't see more than one house. Remember, there are five towns, five cities, five sister cities. There was only one house of Muslims. One house of people who stayed true to God. One house. Nabi Lut and his daughters. And remember this, by the way. Nabi Lut and his daughters were people who were born in that community. Born in that community. Raised in that community. Nabi Lut, he married a woman from that community. In the beginning, researchers tell us that she was pious. She was righteous. Later on, she never became gay. She never became gay, but she was a symbol for kufr in the Quran. That when Allah wants to give an example for kufr, all kufr, he gives the example of the wife of Nabi Lut. So their mother is a symbol of kufr. Everyone in the town is gay. Everyone in the town. Just before I, I came, you know, I was delivering the lecture, I went and I looked at a recent article from Newsweek. Newsweek, this is June. In June, June 27th, apparently. Newsweek released an article. And they said that many Americans vastly overestimate the number of people that are gay in America. They said the average American thinks it's like one out of every four people is gay, right? They bought the hype. Newsweek was saying, according to the Gallup poll, the actual numbers are 4.5%, 4.5%. But still, how does the way that we're thinking, oh my God, everybody. Right? Those are all the people with all the variations that are out there. The people who identify as gay and bi and everything else, only 4.5%. What was their community like though? Not even one person had not been afflicted by this. They grew up in that community. They, those girls, they demonstrated and held the beliefs you and I say about believers. I'll give you some examples. We say that in order to be considered a mu'min, in order to be considered a believer, you have to have intellectual conviction. You have to be sure, you personally, that Islam is right. Their father is a Nabi. The mother is the symbol of kufr. They chose Islam, intellectual conviction. Islam, in order to be considered a mu'min, according to Quran, I have to be committed to the wajibat. It's not just enough that it's in my heart. They had the wajibat. More than that, in Islam, we can't pick and choose. Not our favorite parts of Islam. They also were people who didn't do that, and they also resisted. Wait till you hear the story. And their sacrifice, and what they were willing to do in order to save. So, there's a lot of differences between our story and that biblical story. The Quran correct, just like we did for Nabi Sulaiman. The character assassination, how many of us remember the stuff that was said about Nabi Sulaiman and how the Quran said that ma kafara, he didn't do kufr, right? Or the stuff that was said about Nabi Dawood or the mother of Nabi Sulaiman. So the Quran goes over and it clarifies that those misconceptions. Now, there's something else you and I want to do if we want to really learn real lessons from this story. There's another question we need to ask. What makes a person so special in the way of Allah? Allah sees such goodness in a man or a woman that they're able to go under the most unbelievable, extraordinary, difficult circumstances and succeed. 
A mission like that, remember, Nabi Dawood, Nabi Lut, to go into a people who are already fawcett, already corrupt, and raise a family there. That's what your job. Go raise a family there, bring those people back. And we'll read, read later in the hadith. He didn't let he went one day and he tried and he gave up. 30 years, blood, sweat, and tears. Nabi Lut was over there resisting and fighting. And then after that, so why is it that Allah would choose him? What made him so special to be under those kind of circumstances and to be able to succeed? Now what happens, brothers and sisters, is in order to understand that part, there's no way to do that without understanding his spiritual persona, his connection with God. The same way that it wouldn't be right, let's say you and I wanted to do a study of Karbala, and we only talked about the battle, the sacrifice of them, but we didn't talk about their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember how they're described in the hadith? This is what the hadith say about Imam and his companions. Wabat al Hussein. This is the connection between Allah and Wabat al Hussein wa ashabuhu tilka layla. So Imam Hussein and his companions on that night, the night before the battle began, they stayed awake. There was a buzzing, when you would listen to their munajat, their prayers, there was a buzzing like this buzzing of bees. It says, Some of them were standing, some of them are kneeling, some of them ruku, some of them sujood, that spiritual connection. So later we're going to see what they, the battle, that epic battle on Karbala. But the backdrop, the context, is that connection that's there between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you and I also want to see, what was Nabi Lut like? What was his connection with God like? Why did Allah choose him? Now, for the month of Ramadan, brothers and sisters, we got to know one of our shohada, one of the more recent shohada, Shaheed Ibrahim Hadi. And what happened is we learned about his sacrifice later on, his shahada, how wonderful this individual was. But what about the backdrop, his connection to God? I want to give you two stories and after that talk a little bit in the story of Nabi Lut. One of his friends is telling a story. He says that we were going to the battlefront. So we're leaving Tehran, we're driving over to the battlefront. He says that we're not yet at a town named Kerman Shah. We're driving, we're in a car, a taxi. He says that I notice that Ibrahim is next to me, and as we drive, he keeps waking up all of a sudden, and he's checking his watch. Go a little further, he wakes up again from his sleep, he's checking his watch. So I said, oh, Ibrahim, what's going on? What's happening? So Ibrahim says this. He says that Fajr comes in at four in Kerman Shah. They're going to the battlefield, going to sacrifice themselves. He said Fajr comes in at 4 a.m. I don't want to be awake or sleep and miss the Fajr prayer. He says he dozed off again. Again, he woke up, and when he woke up this time, he says he just stayed awake. He said, we waited till we got over there to the town of Kerman Shah. Ibrahim told the director, they pulled up to a coffee shop, and they made salah, made salah. Later on, there's another story that he tells, him or the other friends of the Shaheed. They say that now we're on the battlefront, it's summertime. He says that we were, so he's with him at this time. He says it was, we spent all day over there, and he said what Ibrahim was doing, he said mainly we're going around, this is not the actual battle. Battlefront, what was Ibrahim doing? What was life of Ibrahim like? He says that we would be going from here to there, and the main thing Ibrahim would be doing would be helping the servants of God, solving people's problems, going over and helping them. He said once we finished that, we went over to some of the brothers, the Basiji's brothers. We were hanging out with those brothers. He said, when we finish that, now late in the evening, by the time this story ends, he says, 2.30 2 in the morning. He said, we went over and we were talking to some of the youth. And indirectly, Ibrahim is over there giving guidance. So we've been up busy from, all, from morning. He says that what happened was, now it's 2.30 in the evening. He says, I was about to go home. So I told Ibrahim, I said, you know, Ibrahim, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go home. What are you going to do? So Ibrahim said, you can go home if you want. He said, but it's 2.30 in the morning. He says, I'm afraid I might miss my Fajr prayer. 
He says, what happened? Ibrahim says, I'm going to wait over here at this masjid. He says, Ibrahim starts looking around. And what happens is, Ibrahim sees a box like for a refrigerator. I don't know how many of you have seen that. If you've done moving, there's a big box that's there. Empty box for a refrigerator. Ibrahim takes that box. He says he goes over and he lays it down. There's a masjid that's close by. He lays it down on the entrance of the masjid. It was about six feet long. The entrance of the masjid about six feet long. He lays it down on the entrance of the masjid. And Ibrahim lays down. So Ibrahim said, you know, what's going to happen is in two hours it's going to be Fajr time. Everybody's going to come because they want to make Salat and Jama'ah. When they want to come to make Salat and Jama'ah, they'll wake me up. He says that not only will my prayer not become Qadha, I'll make Fajr and Jama'ah. That kind of a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, later on the person becomes Ibrahim Hadi. So now a little bit about our story of Nabi Lut and the stuff that he's going to be able to achieve. This first verse, because what happens is, there are some verses that describe him along with other Anbiya. So they mention the names of several of famous Anbiya. And obviously, whatever traits were mentioned for the Anbiya are going to be mentioned for Nabi Lut. The verses that I chose, brothers and sisters, are verses that are just about him. Just some of the verses that talk about his station with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason being that let's find out the connection between what he did and his spiritual status and later what he's going to be able to accomplish. Salawat, please. Now, for those of us who are familiar with the story, the story of Nabi Lut doesn't start with his prophethood or his risala. Rather, he's one of those individuals who believes at the time of Nabi Ibrahim. Nabi Ibrahim was resisting during the time of Nimrud. And it's not time to tell the story of Nabi Ibrahim, but imagine somebody who's so wicked, so crazy, that he's going to take the person who's Khalilur Rahman, Nabi Ibrahim, and burn him alive in a fire. Khalilur Rahman, God's friend, how angry must I be? How wicked must I be to burn Khalilur Rahman in a fire? So at the time of Nimrud, Lut believes. And his Iman, brothers and sisters, seems to be a game changer. Listen to this. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to describe Nabi Lut and talk about what makes Nabi Lut special, one of them, Surah 29, verse number 26, God says this. فَآمَنَ لَهُ Lut. Lut began to believe in him. Right? That was significant. When Lut came to accept the message of Nabi Ibrahim, he was going to put in the work that was a game changer. God talks about him in other times. And you're going to see later, he was a basiji for Nabi Ibrahim. He would do the grunt work for Nabi Ibrahim. Well, later on, when I tell you about his spiritual status, we'll see that. But later. A little bit more about him and his spiritual station, his connection with God. This Surah Anbiya, verse number 71, God says this, Waluta, Lut, atainahu hukma wa ilma. We granted him that knowledge, that judgment, that ilm. Wanajainahu min al qaryatillati kanat ta'amalu al khaba'if. We rescued him from that city that used to do those ugly, vicious acts, those khaba'if. These were terrible people. They were very wicked people. God again goes back to Nabi Lut. We made Lut enter into our special mercy. Definitely Lut was one of the salihin. Brothers and sisters, the highest spiritual station that one can attain in the Quran is the state of being salih, one of the salihin. And the Quran says that he's one of the salihin. Now, brothers and sisters, he wasn't just a passive member of the community. He was one of those who was on the front lines. He believed in Nabi Ibrahim at that difficult time. Later on, you'll see he becomes one of the mursaleen, one of the prophets, not only a Nabi, but also a Rasul. So we had in some hadith, 124,000 prophets. Only 313 had the lofty station of being a rasul, and Nabi Lut was one of them. 
wa inna lutan la min al mursalin truly lut was one of those people who was one of the mursalin so one of the 313 special prophets of god but he was one of those individuals who although he was receiving revelation from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he was one of the people who would promote the sharia of nabi ibrahim so he would promote the sharia and laws of nabi ibrahim now we're going to learn a lot about ideological bravery inshallah ideological bravery let me just mention the concept a little bit when the leader talks about bravery the bravery of a middle mu'minin and you and i we we hear these stories the stories of a middle mu'minin those are stories just hearing the story or sharing the story gives us shivers i remember once there was a young man, and his father was taking him to school. He had a bully he was dealing with. The young man is over in Iran. The young man was, he's a little kid at this time. And the father knew this is one of those situations where you've got to deal with the bully yourself. I can't do everything for you. We can talk to the administration, but eventually you have to go over and you have to deal with the bully. So he's taking this young boy to go over there and deal with the bully. So the little boy is getting ready to go on and take on that big bad bully. So he turns to his dad and he says, Tell me some of those stories of Imam Ali. You tell me those stories of Imam Ali, I'm going to go and I'm gonna tear somebody up now once I hear those stories, right? Those stories of Imam Ali, they give bravery, they give shivers to us. What the leader says is this, the bravery that you and I see of Ali on the battlefield was nothing compared to the ideological bravery of Ali when he was not on the battlefield. The bravery that you and I are going to see from Nabi Lut and his daughters under those circumstances is going to be definitely something special that inshallah we'll be able to do. But keep this in mind. This is what the Prophet says about or what's said about Imam Ali. And after that, you'll see the connection with Nabi Lut. Whenever there was a difficult mission, a challenging mission, an impossible task, the Prophet would send Ali over there. And the hadith says this. Uh, he says that ma lam tanzil bihi shiddatun qat. It would never be the case that any difficulty would descend on the Prophet illa except qaddamahu laha. He would send Ali over to take care of that impossible mission. Thiqatan bih. Out of the trust that he had in Ali. And now on the time of Nabi Ibrahim, the person who's chosen to go to the five sister cities Sodom and Gomorrah, those persons, that person is Nabi Lut. Now you see in Islam, being a leader, right, it's different than the, the way that leadership is promoted in the West. There's a lot of people talk about, I want to be a leader, right? In Islam, the idea of leading is very different. It's more about service. The hadith say this, Sayyidul Qawm Khadimuhum. The leader of a group of people is the servant of these people. So now Nabi Lut is going to go over and try his best, and we'll see the methods that he used to save these individuals. But it's very different to what we find sometimes in the West with the idea of being a leader. And sometimes people fall into this trap. Everybody wants to be a leader. And being a leader is very different. As I said, it's service in Islam. I heard a story once, inshallah, it's not true. They said once this guy, he went to go over and he went to buy a parrot from the store. So he goes in and he sees that there's three identical parrots sitting there in the parrot shop. So he tells the guy at the store, he says, how much for the parrots? The store owner said, it depends which one. If you mean the one on the right, he's $200. He said, $200 for a parrot? He said, yeah. He said, this parrot, he can answer phone calls, take notes, he said, what about the parrot next to him? He said, the parrot next to him, he's $300. He said, $300? He said, yeah. Not only does he take notes, he speaks Chinese. He said, what about the last parrot? He said, that parrot, he's $2,000. He said, $2,000? He said, yeah. He said, what does he do? He said, I haven't seen him do anything. But the first two parrots, they call him boss. So in Islam, in Islam, it's not just who calls who boss. Somebody who's going to go over and do the work. So now what happens is we've come to a little bit about 
the story. I'm going to mention one story for us to share later. And after that, inshallah, we're going to have masa'ib. And after the masa'ib, we're going to have poetry. One story for us to share. Because remember, if I remember in the beginning of the speech, I said this story is a story not only with us, but also with the people of the book, the book before us, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's not something for which the ruling of God is hidden. Everybody knows what God says about the sin of Nabi Lut. My question is this, does religion evolve according to the taste of the people? If the people don't like something, does God's deen change? There's a verse of the Quran that talks, it says this, Surah 9, verse number 31, They took their scholars and monks as lords. There's a man named Adi. Adi is coming, he was one of the people of the book. He's now coming into Islam. He comes across this verse and he asks Rasulullah, he says, what does the Quran mean that they took, we the people of book, we took our scholars and monks as arbab, as gods. Mindunillah. The Prophet asked him a question. He said, wasn't it the case that something would be forbidden in the deen? It would be haram in the deen. And the scholars would change that? They would say it was halal? Or something would be halal. And the scholars would change that. And they'd make it haram? Hadith said, yeah. Religion evolved. The Prophet said, that is shirk. That's ibadah. That's taking them as gods. Min dunillah. In Islam, religion doesn't involve, and we're supposed to always make sure we stay on that right path.